just um, a little bit about me. I am an openly queer mom with three humans, two pups, and up until a little while ago, I was a high school teacher. Um, I have a handful of endocrine, genetic, and autoimmune disorders. I'm an adrenaline junkie and a super nerd. And I have a super sunny disposition despite everything going on in my life and the fact that I will never see 50. So my talk is a life too short but lived with death. Why dying in your 40s isn't as bad as one might assume. So this is not going to be a surface conversation. Um, it's a difficult topic. It's okay to talk about death, though people do not like to talk about death. Um, we don't need to tiptoe around it. There is no wrong question. Um, at the end in the Q&A, ask whatever you want to ask. It is okay. Um, I am an open book and I am definitely not easily offended. So this was me five years ago. Um, and our thematic word for today is death. The quality of being intense or extreme, and that could definitely define my life. Um, I am a huge adrenaline junkie. I need to live my life to the fullest. I need to get that like feeling from doing things like zip lining upside down and rappelling down waterfalls, um, scrambling down mountains. And I did all of these things. And then one day I couldn't walk. Um, I had to crawl to the bathroom and I had to fight to get my mobility back to get my life back. So I'm still that adrenaline junkie. Um, I am a total badass on my all-terrain trike. Um, I had to switch from a mountain bike to a trike because when I fall, I break things very, very easily. Um, I go to amusement parks, I hike, I do all of these things still. Um, I live my life to the fullest, but there is a cost to all of that. Um, so being authentically me to live my life with depth and meaning requires me to use more energy than I sometimes have. Um, so everything kind of has a bit of a price to it. So before I get into that, I'll introduce you to my peoples. So I have three children and a partner, Christy, as well. And we do everything. We camp, we go to amusement parks, we do all of the things. So this is um, a mix of pictures. So there's some with the helmet. When I am around another human, I have to wear my respirator. So this has a full pack to filter my air. And you guys can hear that lovely. So I hear that all the time. And when I'm wearing my respirator, some of these pictures are before I got sick, when my children were younger, and I did not have to wear this lovely little system that keeps me alive. So with my respirator, it means that my current, currently my kids and my partner cannot live in my home with me. Um, when I am de-respiratored, I am 100% by myself, with the exception of my puppies, um, and I can't have other people around me. Um, so I am in the process of building a home that actually has two sides. It will be ready next month. Um, so I have one side which we call the clean side and then we have the dirty side. So when I go into the dirty side, I wear my respirator and that's when I can hug my kids and my partner and I can live my life with this. And then on the clean side, I decontaminate, I come over and I can take all of this off and just be. So it's kind of a little bit of a weird world. Um, my kids currently live with their other parents and I live with my exes and then I have either visits with them outside distance or with my respirator on. So I have a little bit of a weird life. My kids, um, my youngest currently actually comes and stays in the garage, our heated garage in the tent trailer um, with my partner so that we can have that family time together. Um, so once I have my house done, it will be completely life-changing for me. So I have two dogs right now and um, two dogs that have passed in the last year as well during COVID and they kept and kept and do keep me sane because I don't know how many, how many of you guys have pets? Almost everybody. Yeah. So you know what your dogs do for your mental health and for all of those day-to-day -day things. There's nothing like coming home and then your dog is like, oh my God, you're the most epic thing on the planet. 
Well, when you can't have any human contact, because before I got my respirator, there was about a year where I had zero human contact. The only person to touch me was a nurse who was taking my blood and I almost started crying when she touched my arm and she's like digging around in veins and it's not pleasant, but a human had touched me and I hadn't been touched by a human in a year. And so my dogs have been what have really kept me going in that point in time because I could see my kids, but it was literally through a window or distance. And you got to remember like the winter time, you can't, you know, it's, it was very difficult. So they were my only physical contact. And now if we could see pictures, there would be pictures of like sunrises because during COVID I was, I would take pictures of sunrises. I would go hiking and triking and crafting and gardening and doing all those things. So I kept very, very active doing um, things like cooking and baking. There's sunrises and some of the photography that I do. Hiking and triking. Um, so I will hike and trike. It comes at a cost to me to do that sort of physical movement, but I absolutely love it. Some more hikes. We're so lucky in Alberta. We have such beautiful stuff. Gardening, coloring, crafting, all those fun things. Cooking and baking, I absolutely love to do. Eating is like half the reason I'm still alive. All right, so my health. I have a handful of autoimmune, endocrine, and genetic disorders. So here's a list. It is not a full list of everything I have, um, but it gives you an idea. Basically, I'm a medical mess or marvel, as some of my doctors might say. My uh, GP jokes that they will name a disease after me someday. Um, so they have said that eight years from now, I've heard from four different doctors now, eight years from now, we will have some answers. But those answers won't give me um, a solution, if you will. The damage is done, so it can't be undone. My body is what my body is at this point. Um, and there, there's, there's no good solution for what is going on. Um, so I have so many different things wrong with me that don't play nicely together. So Addison's disease means I don't produce cortisol, and you can't live without cortisol. So I take steroids every day to stay alive. Um, unfortunately, I also have Ehlers-Danlos, which is a connective tissue disease, and Ehlers-Danlos and steroids are not friends. They do not like each other. Steroids break down your connective tissue faster, um, so my body's breaking down. Many of the things I have stack up on top of each other, and over the last year, I have almost died several times. Um, so the scariest time was when my partner, Christy, called me in the morning, and I couldn't wake up. So Christy calls me every morning and every night. Um, soon it'll be calling from the house next door, which will be lovely. Um, and I couldn't wake up when she called. And I knew my phone was ringing, and I knew if I didn't wake up and take my medication, I would slip into a coma and I would die. I knew that in my head. Um, but I couldn't get myself to roll over. Uh, and I had this thought in my head of, it's okay, you'll die, just go to sleep, you'll slip into a coma, that's okay. Um, for some reason, my alarm did not go off that morning. It's never happened before. My Apple phone, pretty reliable, but I don't know why it didn't go off. And so Christy called me again, and this time I was somehow able to roll over and grab the phone and she was able to talk me through taking my medication. If she hadn't called that second time, I would have just slipped into a coma and I would have died because I cannot produce the cortisol to live. Um, and so that was pretty scary. I called my endocrinologist and within 20 minutes, my endocrinologist had a prescription in for a new medication, um, which is dexamethasone. Love me some dexamethasone. It uh, literally keeps me from dying in my sleep at night, so I am a fan. Um, but um, there are consequences. So the more steroids I take, and I take a ridiculously high amount of steroids, um, the more damage it does to my body. So as you can see from my sexy bracing, I am super fragile. So my joints go out of place, and I fracture easily, um, like 
super easy. Not too long ago, I had two fractured feet. So I was walking around in double air casts. So instead now I have my custom ankle foot orthotics, which keep it so that when I'm walking around, I'm not breaking myself. Also why I switched from a bike to a trike, because um, when you fall off a bike, you tend to break things much easier. Um, so there is, if you go to the next one, I think a nice photo of me with my double air casts on. So you can see some of the tools that I have. So there's my AFOs and my knee braces. Um, I shower with a shower chair. There's my double air cast. I have my awesome cane. Um, and this kind of explains a little bit about Ehlers-Danlos. So basically it's a connective tissue disease. The glue that holds us together sucks on me. I was born with this and so I was born with bad parts basically. Part of what I also have is mitochondrial dysfunction. So my mitochondria just sucked from the beginning. And then you combine that with Ehlers Danlos, you get what you get. Um, so I won't go into details of all my disorders, and you guys can ask questions about them after if you want to know more. Um, but they're very entertaining and often debilitating. Let me go to the next one. And there are bonus points if you can guess the ref cultural references in these. Anybody for the first one? No one? Oh, epic 80s then, air supply. I come with my own air supply. And um, the other one is the bionic woman. Because some people will say that, oh, I think that picture's cut off. That's okay. On this side, there is a picture of bionic woman. And I love to have fun with my medical stuff and make fun of myself. My kids also do that as well. So my eight-year-old makes fun of me all the time, and it is epic. I love it. I encourage it. Um, he gets tired of when we go places and I'm wearing the, the respirator. People ask questions, and then eventually he'll go, my mom's body sucks. And they're like, yes, that's an epic answer that is totally valid. So um, if you go to the next one, I come with all sorts of cool accessories, like my epic hospital bed. So I can't lay down for long periods of time. If I lay down for longer than 20 minutes, my heart does really uncomfortable things. Um, so I have an amazing hospital bed, CPAP machine, walker, blood pressure, cuff, all of those things. Um, and the far left corner is my calendar. So each day I cross off um, a day. So I have a goal. I would like to see 45. I'm 41 right now. So my goal right now, is 45 um and so every day i wake up i cross a little tick off the calendar i'm excited i wake up i love life um and there's some images on this side of some of my medical research i have literally read thousands of medical papers like thousands so many <laughs> um and i love the research but we've reached the point where there's little more that can be done and it's Sorry, don't do that. <laughs> um, and the things that are keeping me alive are also killing me. I can't get vaccinated for COVID um, because I'm so complex. The vaccine itself could kill me, but COVID would definitely kill me. COVID is so uniquely made. My GP is like, it's like they made COVID to take you out because all of the different disorders and diseases that I have are things that COVID impacts. So my immune system, there's different... Um, things within your immune system. So one of the things for me that does not work at all is fighting off um, respiratory illnesses. Hence the sexy respirator. Um, so it's not just COVID, a flu, and anything like that has a respiratory um, sort of component to it will take me out. But I am fortunate that I have the resources and live in Canada, thank you Canada, um, to support my surviving this long and hopefully a few years longer. Um, but that said, every day is a gift and I never know how many I have left. Every night I go to bed, I don't know if I'm going to wake up in the morning. Every night I say to my puppies, good night, I love you, I'll see you in the morning. And I, if I forget to do that, I will literally go back upstairs and say, I'll see you in the morning because I'm setting that intention out that I'm going to wake up in the morning and I'm going to, you know, see my puppies and I'm going to do my day. Um, 
I'm done spending all my days doing research because I know um, if I was to reach, reach the point where I needed resuscitation or something like that, I wouldn't survive. Um, they might be able to resuscitate me for a short period of time, but because of how fragile I am, um, I would break ribs, I would tear tissue, I would be dislocated. I wouldn't survive more than a few days. So with that said, let's go to the next one. Um, I have signed goals of care designation C1. So most people don't know what goals of care is because most people don't really think about death. We don't want to think about death. It's really scary. And so once you're at, at the point of, you know, figuring out what you want, if something were to happen, um, sometimes it's too late, right? So if you were to get in a car accident and nobody knows what your wants are, what your desire is, it's hard for them to know what to do. So sometimes, you know, this is not a bad thing to do for everybody. Um, for me, this means that we're looking at symptom control rather than cure. So I have a diagnosis that will cause eventual death. This means there's no resuscitation, no life support, no life-sustaining measures unless they're directed at symptom management. And I didn't make this decision lightly. Um, I talked with my people first, and it's not because I want to die. I love life. I do not want to die. I would love to be 100 years old. I would love to see grandchildren and great-grandchildren, but it's not in the cards for me. So that gives me kind of a, a unique perspective. Perfect. So this brings me to my bucket list and living life to the fullest. So these are just some of the things that I've done. And for some things, I have to make special arrangements, like going to an amusement park with my helmet on is a little bit challenging for some things. So I had to like talk to the head of security at Callaway Park and make special arrangements to be able to go there. But I am doing everything I possibly can to live life to the fullest. I have also chosen to leave my body to the University of Calgary Medical Research Program um, so that I can do go on doing what I love, which is teaching, even in death. Um, I am actually, people think I'm creepy because I'm like, I want to set the intention that I want to go and when I die, I want to watch them dissect my body because I think it would be so cool to see. Because I have the weirdest things. I have extra organs. So I have a, what are called accessory organs from my Ehlers Danlos. So I have like a little extra spleen. I have a little extra liver, cute little baby organs. Um, all of my joints are weird. I have weird lumps, weird bumps, fractures everywhere. My body's fascinating. So I am excited about that. Next one. So I talked before about the cost. So for me to live my life to the fullest and be the adrenaline junkie that I am, I have to pay for that. So when I do something, it's like a roller coaster. And there's a cost and there's a price. So that brings us to spoon theory. So if you guys look at this chart, and this is just kind of like a basic, I want you to assign yourself a number of values. So look at the things, look at how many points they're worth, and just kind of come up with a number in your head of what you would use in a day. So Christine was out to dinner with a friend, and she was trying to explain what it was like to live with an invisible illness. So she has lupus. And having to think about all of those things that healthy people don't have to think about. So when you're healthy, you have a never-ending supply of spoons. You can take a nap, you can pull energy out, you can grab a coffee, you can do whatever to give yourself a little boost, but in the end, you're going to recover. Um, so everything you do has, has a cost. If you're sick or you didn't sleep well the day before, then you start with less spoons. You can borrow spoons from the next day, but when you do that, you start out with less spoons the next day. And you want to try and keep a reserve spoon so you have something for if something happens. And it also means you have to make a lot of choices. So basically, she dumped out a lot of spoons on the table and told her friend that, um, I'm going to go to the next one, that you, you have unlimited spoons. So you can just ask for more. But somebody who's sick has 12 spoons. So if you think about your numbers, how many had a number higher than 12? Most people, right? Because you're going to do things in the day. Even if you have a chill day, you're still going to use up a fair bit of spoons doing different things, whatever that is. 
Um, if you have a busy day, you're going to use more spoons. So for me, or somebody else with another chronic illness or illnesses, you have limited amount of energy. And that can be really difficult. And we don't know who has these issues, right? So that's another thing I want to impart on you guys is a lot of illnesses are invisible. Before I got to the point where I had all of my bracing and my respirators, like you saw the pictures from five years ago, that was two months before I got diagnosed. Um, that was two months before I almost died the first time. And after that, my life changed drastically, but I didn't look sick. I looked like everybody else. I looked like a 30 something year old walking around like everybody else but I would have to stop to catch my breath. I literally had to crawl to get to the bathroom. To get myself and my body back, I set targets where I would walk from one light post to the next light post, and I'd add a light post every day until my walk got further and further, and I got to the little pond by my house, and I was like, yes, but now I gotta get back, right? And it took that progress, and I looked like I was fine. I looked like everybody else, um, but I was really sick. And when I first got my handicap pass, people are like giving me dirty looks and I'm going, I seriously need to use all my energy just to do what I'm doing. But when I leave, I've used up all my spoons. I don't have anything left. And so I need that. So we just don't know who has an illness or whatever, right? So we can go to the next one. So it brings us back to the word death. And one could apply it to how we live our lives. Um, I have an intense and extreme love of life. Unfortunately, with that perfect trifecta of my autoimmune, endocrine, and genetic disorders, that poses some challenges. Um, prior to COVID, I was working on getting healthy and getting back into the world of teaching. Um, two weeks before COVID, I got back to Forest Lawn High School, which was the school that I was teaching at for several years. One of the biggest loves of my life is Forest Lawn High School. It is an amazing place. Um, and then they moved me into online teaching. And I was like, yay, I can still teach. And I did that for a few years. And then my health hit um, some more hiccups. And I found myself at a point where doctors, they didn't know what to do anymore. I didn't know what to do anymore. And I was just done working so hard on solving a puzzle that was literally missing pieces. And so things had to change. So now I'm going to share a secret with you, the secret of life, from what I think it is. So students would ask me at the end of the day when I asked if there was any more questions, what was the secret of life? And they do it to be, you know, funny. Um, but I, I'm going to tell you guys what it is, what I think it is. So the secret is twofold. One is to live life to the fullest, like each day could be your last. And the second is to teach with life. I literally have that tattooed on my body is to teach with love. Don't say that thing you want to do or say for later because none of us know if there is a later. And second, don't be an asshole. Be respectful of yourself and others. Be kind, do nice things for people and do nice things for yourself and your life will be better. Teach with love. Um, so I'm an openly queer socialist teacher with three incredible kids, two adorable dogs, and an amazing partner. I have an incredible friend group. Um, and as a queer, I have some practice with being othered. I know what it's like to have comments, to have stares, to walk down the street and people literally walk to the other side of the street, things like that. But I don't think I was prepared for how disability would impact my life. And I wasn't prepared for people thinking that my choice to live um, was something that they should comment on. No, my helmet is not for going into space or for protecting me from radiation, all comments I've had. And no, you don't need to swear at me or berate me for protecting myself. And telling someone that they should die is rude. At least that's what I was taught. Uh, as a person of death, I'm also a person who feels really deep. I want to be connected to people. I'm a highly creative person. I want to go to plays. I want to go to museums and listen to the orchestra. I want to go on adventures. I want to see the world and I want to share myself with the world. So now I can do that through digital means, like I have a YouTube channel, um, 
or I can go into the world with my respirator on. Each time I go into the world, it's anxiety ridden. I hide it really well, but each and every time I am near another human, including my humans, it's a little bit scary. I never know what someone's reaction is going to be. Um, but I choose not to live in fear. I choose to live every day the way that I want to, so this means that I do everything I can to find my joy. I am in pain 24 7. Um, I take no pain medications and I control my pain mostly through mental tips and tricks. Thanks, Sherlock Holmes and the Memory Palace, that's where my pain goes. So I've created a space inside my brain where I can hold that pain. Um, occasionally, it slips out, and the amount of pain that I am in is almost unbearable um, until I get that mental control back in. Part of my lovely conglomeration of illnesses is cognitive decline. I have multiple degrees as well as a trade, and I often found myself being the smartest person in the room. And I don't say that lightly, I come from a trauma background. Um, and generally thought I was stupid for a very long time. Um, I worked very hard for my education. I have um, learning disabilities and I have a lot of challenges, a lot of trauma. I graduated my last degree with 4.0. I started my first degree um, uh, less than a year after I found my brother's body after we committed suicide. I have, and that is only one of over 15 major traumas that I've been through. And there's an interesting intersection between trauma and physical illness, um, a whole other conversation. But I busted my ass for my education. Um, I had some amazing supports along the way as well. But now, I lose my words, I find the wrong words, I forget things, and sometimes I feel like I've lost myself. Which is why I have my notes, because sometimes I literally lose myself. I will often replace a similar word and it will make no sense, but it will start with the same letter, end with the same letter, and be about the same length. Um, and I'll substitute it in people like, I have no idea what you're trying to say. Um, people who know me, like my partner and my friends, they know exactly what I'm trying to say. Sometimes I have to go, you know the thing that does the thing? That, you know, we stick with my hands, do things like that. I've got lots of little tips and tricks, and the people who know me know how to do that. But I am slowly losing myself. And that will get to more and more over time. And gain neuroplasticity, I can figure out new ways to do things. So instead of getting so frustrated about losing a word now, I will just find something else that's similar and substitute that way. Um, and physically, my decline is more rapid than we would like. I just got my first wheelchair and have used it a few times. And it's hard to go from being somebody who can literally scramble up and down a mountain, no problem, five years ago, to having to use a wheelchair. Um, Don't worry, I'm also going to get a very badass electric wheelchair when I get to that point. Um, so I can still go off-roading. Very important to me. And all that said, I am still disgustingly optimistic and cheery most of the time. Um, don't get me wrong, sometimes it, cut, it gets to me and I have a good, ugly cry on the bathroom floor or go out deep into the woods and scream, fuck you! I highly recommend it. It's epic. Um, but then I always pick myself up and I find that silver lining because life is always more good than bad. It's kind of my tagline. I say it in my YouTube stuff. It's really gross eventually. Um, but it's true. And I have the privilege of knowing that I have limited time and every single day matters. I've had to figure out new ways to do things physically and discovered so much joy in this new challenge because I have to go out there and I have to like rejig something. I have to do something a little bit different and it's fun to figure out new things. It's challenging. Um, no longer being the smartest person in the room means less people are coming to me for solutions to grand problems. Instead, they're coming to me for things like emotional support. And people have less expectations of me to be that grand problem solver. And there's a relief in that. I used to be that teacher that they would send that student that no other teacher could deal with. They would send them to me because I could always figure it out. But now that's not that expectation anymore. 
Um, I have had the privilege of living for pleasure and helping others. Um, my health is a full-time job. I spend much of my day taking medications, putting on braces, splints, my super sexy CPAP machine. But I also have time to run support groups and join in other support groups. Right? Like Steve was saying, that's how I met them was through one of the support groups. And it's amazing. I get to record videos and share what I've learned with other people. And I have more time for the incredibly supportive people that I have in my life. My amazing friend group, my family. And yes, I have lost a lot of people. Joining me in this journey has been too difficult for some people for various reasons. Um, I don't judge those reasons. And I have nothing but love for those people who have chosen to distance from me. Um, that said, I have met and made incredible friends, um, both in person and online. And um, I've gotten so much closer to some of the people in my life. My dad and I, we were really close when I was a little kid. And then life happens and things get busy and he has work. And But now my dad and I are so tight. My bonus mom, my stepmom, I call her my bonus mom because she's so much more than just a stepmom. We're so close. Other people I have developed these relationships with, which are incredible. And I am so grateful for this. And without my illnesses, I would not have had the chance to learn and grow from so many amazing humans. So I think a lot about legacy and what I will leave behind. And what I hope is that it is a legacy of love and depth. So that quality of being intense or extreme in pursuit of a life filled with love and adventure and joy. So I want to leave you with one final thought. Dying in your 40s is not so bad because I know every single day matters and that is an incredible gift. I am fitting a lifetime of living into as many years as I have left.